Welcome to the Oregon Matters of State podcast. This is Deputy Secretary of State Rich Vile, and I'm here today with Bev Clarno, the Secretary of State. Bev, uh, we've been talking about doing a podcast for some time. I sense you're really excited about this. Oh, very excited, Rich. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, the, the sarcasm is actually dripping. So, <laughs> Bev, uh, this is something that we've been talking about wanting to do to give people the opportunity to just get to know who's serving them in government. Let's start out by asking you, why did you bother at your age, and we don't have to, you can tell them your age, I won't, coming back to the state capitol in Oregon, clear over the mountains, and taking on a job like the Secretary of State. Well, coming clear over the mountains in the wintertime is going to be a challenge, that's for sure. And I've rethought several times my uh, decision to put my name in the hat. But after 20, nearly 20 years in public life in the legislature, in the House and the Senate, I knew I understood the Secretary of State's office and felt like um, carrying forward where Dennis Richardson had started uh, was something that I could and should do. And I talked to my husband about it, and as always, he was very encouraging, said, well, you know you can do it, so I think you ought to give it a try. Well, I'll tell you, the people of the state of Oregon are certainly appreciative of the experience that you bring to this office. I think what they'd like to hear a little bit about is why you have that kind of experience in the first place. What in the world drove you to get involved in politics and maybe a little bit about your background, what got you into politics? Well, I don't know exactly where it started. I know it started on the hog farm for sure, but my background is I was born on the Oregon coast and uh, moved from that area when I was six years old to my uncle's dairy in Redmond, Oregon, where I learned a work ethic and certainly knew that I never wanted to own a dairy. Um, <laughs> getting up at 3.30 in the morning to milk cows and milking cows the minute you got off the bus at 3.30 in the afternoon. It was not my idea of really much fun. But anyway, then, um, of course, I graduated from high school in Redmond, and then I moved to Sherman County, where I lived for the next 22 years, raising four children and being involved in the hog business with my brother-in-law. We had um, 250 sows and marketed about 400 hogs a month, which is a total head count at any one time of um, about 3,000 hogs. And um, it was there that I was inspected by government inspec inspectors and regulators. And uh, I was overwhelmed at how um, negative and picky they were and kind of in a punishment mode, which I felt government should be helping me do the right thing, not being in a fining and penalty mode. So I thought if I ever get a chance, I will go into the legislature and see if I can't change the way government operates. And I've been doing that, trying to do that for a long time, still doing it. I think I have plenty of work cut out for me. <laughs> you know, your book, Pigs to Politics, has really been uh, an inspiration for a lot of folks in terms of realizing that uh, you don't have to be born into a political life. Um, you, you mentioned you were born on the coast to a family that uh, were hard working, um, worked in the woods, worked uh, on the land. What did that sort of birth heritage help you with? Well, I was really young when I left there, but my dad was the oldest of 12 children, and um, six of those were. Uh, all boys, of course, and they were all involved in some sort of logging, except for my Uncle Jerry, who started Jerry's Jet Boats up the Rogue River, and my uncle, who was uh, sheriff in Gold Beach. But at one point in their lives, they were all involved in logging, which is a hard industry to work in, and you learn a strong work ethic. And you certainly learn a work ethic in a dairy farm. And then next, of course, my mo mother married my stepfather, and we were on a small farm in Terrebonne. And and uh, my brother and I irrigated and um, slopped pigs and milked cows by hand before we went to school. So um, I think having a strong work ethic is something I just have always had and uh, has motivated me to do the things I've done. 
Now, as I understand it, the family in, um, in the southwest coast, that was the Boyce family, the correct? Bo yes, the Boyce family. And, and they were then, and I think still are, active in community service. Oh, and yes. My grandfather was a county um, judge for years. Those smaller counties have what you call a county judge. So um, my grandfather, Alan Boyce, was county judge. And then I have a county commissioner down there that's a cousin, and a county commissioner over in Roseburg that's a cousin. So yeah, and my uh, cousin up in um, Coquille was one of the first women and managers of a city in, in Coquille, my cousin Patty. So yeah, it's, it's rampant in our family. Now you mentioned that you grew up in Terrebonne. Yes. That's a little tiny town uh, south of Madras and north of Redmond. Growing up in Terrebonne, did you ever think you'd learn how to fly and uh, become a real estate appraiser and, uh, I don't know, all these other things? No. No, I think as a little girl in Terrebonne, um, I didn't think much about day, other than day to day how to get through the day and how the things that I had to do and ride the bus to school and whatnot. Um, in later years, some of the influence I had was a, another person who grew up in Terrebonne, who was a guy that was a governor of Oregon, Tom McCall. I had the pleasure of meeting him, and we always called each other the Terrebonne kids. And uh, I didn't have much time to think about. Uh, what I might do in my life. In those days, most women was known as soon as you got out of high school, you should get married and have kids. And I did that, but I also wanted to do other things all my life. And I got to achieve an awful lot of the things that I wanted to do. Um, Bev, in your book, you spend some time talking about some of the difficult things that you went through as a child and as a, as a teenager. Uh, do you think that's helped you in politics? to have some empathy for the people that you're serving? I think so, of course. And I always think that after I got elected, my main job was to be sure and make sure anybody that contacted me had an answer to whatever questions they may have had. Um, yes, my childhood was very difficult. My stepfather was very mean, and I think he'd be in jail under today's standards. kind of wish that had happened at times, but uh, my brother and I worked very hard and were mistreated, and I just think that when you go through things like that, you become a survivor. And when you're a survivor, you understand almost everything anybody else has had to go through. Many things that I've helped people in government with um, have been issues like that, whether it be problems in, in their home or um, with law enforcement or anything else. So I think it ge gives you an idea of how to help everybody else. You've spoken uh, often about when you were a legislature having insiders or, uh, or uh, folks that you could hear from outside of the Capitol helping you in the decision making. Talk a little bit about that if you would. That still happens today, thank goodness. <laughs> yes, uh, when I first got elected I'd heard a lot about Medicare and Medicaid and our child welfare system. and food stamp and fraud waste and government waste in all sorts of manners and so I thought well I'll find out uh, how the system operates so I found out and asked the uh, then person and head of state government if I could attend the welfare training school and it just so happened I was elected in November I wouldn't start to work till January and all the month of December they were having a training course on how to become a welfare caseworker so I took that training and what an eye-opener that was. My heart goes out to caseworkers. They deal with all sorts of human miseries, and their job is very, very difficult. But I found out that helped me understand more in the legislature about not only what people need, but what the caseworkers are going through. And many of those caseworkers became what I call my whistleblowers, people that talked to me about what was wrong in the agency, and what was wrong with management and how management didn't see what needed to be done because they maybe had never been a caseworker. I was able through all of those experiences to bring up, I hope, a better process uh, to the legislative process in my committee hearings.
And, and you still listen to those folks. Yes, I still have people that will talk to me about what's wrong with government, and we see if we can make it right. The, your whistleblowers. Yes, my whistleblowers. <laughs> You're, you're known as a, as a champion of the, uh, of the rural Oregonian, particularly the East Oregonian. Um, but at some point, you came over here to the west side and, and started working. What, what caused that to happen? Well, that was when I was in the hog business. And unfortunately, I had a, had a divorce, and I moved to Lake Oswego. And um, that was the first time I'd ever lived off of a farm in my life. And it was, I lived here for 12 years in Lake Oswego, and I worked downtown Portland. And, you know, it was, it was a uh, culture shock, I will say, because for one thing, you know, we might leave our car on the street in Eastern Oregon and leave the keys in it in case somebody need to borrow it. You obviously don't want to do that in the city. <laughs> and I found that out real quick. But also, um, I felt very violated one time. I became a real estate appraiser and somebody broke into my car and took my camera and all my stuff. And, and if you're in a real rural area in Eastern Oregon, you could probably leave your car open and not worry about somebody taking your camera. So I felt very violated. I thought, gee, this is not so much fun living in the city. But it gave me an appreciation of what the people in the city go through in the way of traffic and finding housing and crowded schools and all those issues that I didn't face in rural Oregon. So it gave me a better understanding. And you met your husband. Yes, I did. Tell, tell us a little bit about how it came that you and Ray Clarno got together. <laughs> well, I became a real estate appraiser and then I had the opportunity to also uh, sell some properties that uh, Ray was uh, Vice President of Carnation living in Los Angeles and um, so the person that normally came from the real estate division couldn't come up from LA and Ray came up and we had a good meeting and I sold um, a big chicken ranch out in Oregon City and I think a flax mill down in Mount, Mount Angel and I'd never even heard of flax mills. But anyway, we worked hard on those properties and became good friends and when he would come to Portland he would always take my sister and I out to dinner. Very charming, still charming. <laughs> Well, it's been a real, uh, a lot of fun for me to hear your stories of family, and I can uh, tell our listeners that you're definitely someone that really believes in the power of family to, to make our lives rich. Speaking of family, there was a family that you got involved with when you were over here on this side of the mountain, the Hatfield family. Oh, tell yes. us just a little bit about that. Well, as I said, I became a real estate appraiser, and uh, I knew this lady named Jan Scopel very well in the office I was in, and her friend Antoinette Hatfield was opening a real estate office in Lake Oswego up by what was the gazebo in Mountain Park where I lived, and they needed someone to be a broker, so I became their real estate broker, and it was really fun. Antoinette uh, is a delightful person as well as was Jan. As Senator Hatfield would come in on the weekends whenever he was home, and he was so sweet, he'd empty my wastebasket, and I was very charmed by him and his wife, lovely people. So, Do you think that um, had anything to do with your desire to become politically involved later? I think Senator Hatfield and Governor McCall both influenced me. Most of all, I wanted to change government, but certainly by meeting those two people, I thought were, I always believe they will have been influential in my life. They were what I call statesmen, and those are few and far between today. So I really think they did influence me a great deal. Another person I loved dearly that influenced me was Senator Ken Jernstead from Hood River. He was a flying tiger during the wall war. I have a picture of his plane that he gave me on his wall. He was a great statesman as well. I'll bet you just loved campaigning. Wasn't that something you oh loved? Oh my to do? gosh, of course, <laughs> yes. Campaigning is the most dreadful part about being a legislator. <laughs> I always say that's the job interview, and there isn't a, bit, a, a, a worse one that I can think of. And campaigning is a lot like putting your life in a blender and turning it on because there's no off button once you start campaigning. You're in and you got to keep going until you drop. And um, if it wasn't for the privilege of serving in the legislature, 
I would have never campaigned again after the first one. It's that difficult. So my heart goes out to the people that are willing to campaign and try to get in there and make a difference because it is difficult. How, how did a woman from Eastern Oregon end up as speaker of the House of Representatives? Tell us a little bit about how that happened. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> One thing when you come into the legislature and in the House you have 60 members and in your caucuses you may have, unless you're divided evenly, you might have 32 and 28, but you have any number of, of members in your caucuses. And actually some of the people often talk a great deal and I didn't. I always kept quiet and learned. And when I cautioned somebody about running and serving in the legislature, I said, you can learn a lot more if you keep your mouth shut and just listen. And I did that. And then when it came time for, there, there was a vacancy for leadership, and I went around and asked all my members if they would support me for being speaker. I got all their support, so, except for one gentleman. I mean, he did give me his support finally, but he said, you know, um, well, I'm not going to tell that story here. But it's the same gentleman that said, uh, I really think women should be in the home in the kitchen making cookies. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were known as a pretty tough cookie, speaking of cookies. Um, <laughs> And, and do you regret any of the uh, hard decisions that you made when you were in leadership? No, absolutely not. I, I think if looking back, I made a, may have made more. It, it was not easy removing members of my own party from a leadership position, but um, my responsibility as Speaker of the House was to move the process along and to not have people um, impede that process or uh, have issues that were important to them, that were selfish in my opinion, to throw a monkey wrench in the whole works. So I just did what I had to do to make the process work. And you were also the caucus leader in the Senate a few years later when you came back to the Capitol. That, that caucus process how has that changed since the days that you were there? Well, the caucus pro process, of course, was very different when I was in the Senate because that was a year we were tied 15-15, and I was the caucus uh, Republican leader and Kate Brown was the Democrat leader, and we had to work together all of December again, trying to put together a memorandum of understanding um, to operate the Senate because you, you don't have anybody in majority. Nobody's in control, everybody. Everybody's in control, they think. <laughs> and I, I see the difference now when I come back and it, um, it seems a lot more um, polarized in the caucuses. And I wish it wasn't that way. We had a lot of compromise, a lot of working together, and a lot of respect for one another. And I think that's the very best way to legislate. Compromise almost seems like it's becoming a dirty word in the building here. Um, what, that wasn't the case when you were no, working here, was it? No, no. Uh, I won't say there weren't partisan conflicts because they were, but many times a lot of the issues were within your own caucus and you ironed those out. And uh, But there was a lot more working across party lines. Right now we have one party with a supermajority. Um, did you ever wish for a supermajority when you were in leadership? Well, I had a pretty good majority when I was Speaker. I had 34 Republicans and Gordon Smith was Senate President and he had 20. I think that was a pretty great majority and I don't know that a supermajority is really a good balance of government. So I guess I would say that when you've got a majority where you can set your agenda and pass that majority without a, with some compromise and respecting others opinions in the other party, that that's a good, that's good government, I believe. But a supermajority, whether it would be my party or, or any other party, I think is not a good balance of power. You were appointed by a Democrat who, um, a lot of speculation about whether or not she was doing that just to make sure that uh, the Republicans didn't get strong again in this office. Do you think that made any difference whatsoever in the way you conduct yourself in this office? 
Oh, I don't think so, and I don't, I don't know that that was the reason. We have a long history of serving together and um, deep respect for one another. I, we don't vote the same, but just because you don't vote the same doesn't mean you can't have a good working relationship. As the governor knows, I would work hard to do the very best I can here, and I'm sure at my age she wouldn't expect that I would run again, although she never asked me that. But uh, speaking of age, I was told when I was sworn in that age is just a number and experience is what really counts. And so therefore, I'm the most experienced Secretary of State Oregon's ever had. <laughs> Very good. Dennis Richardson held this office before you did. And he had a lot of respect among Republicans, particularly here in the state. Well, I would say not just Republicans, but many people in the state, even members that were not Republicans. What have you done to try and make sure that the good things that Dennis was doing in this office can, can be continued? Well, I hope, I, I would like to think that everything he was doing in this office was good, and I'm trying to think that everything I'm doing in this office is good as well. But I also have followed his audit plan, which I thought was a good plan as I reviewed it, and um, been trying to do the things that he had supported in the legislative process as well. And um, been very pleased with all the staff that's here. We have great directors of the various agencies within the Secretary of State's office, and uh, I just feel like we've got a, a very, very good team. We've uh, shared with them that we feel like that with elections and audits, that we are not going to be doing anything that seems partisan simply because we are audits over all Oregon agencies and uh, for all Oregonians and the same with elections for both parties and for all voters. So we're trying very hard to do the things in the Secretary of State's office to make everybody proud. Do you think that um that you'll be able to leave this office feeling like you've accomplished anything? It's such a short period of time. Well, I certainly think so. I think, if nothing else, um, reaching out to various legislators and, and the Legislative Audit Committee and the members of the Ways and Means and having a good working relationship with the Secretary of State's office is very important, and I'm striving to do that during the session and will in the next session and during um, the interim. You've talked a lot about the fact that your real desire is to see good government. What things can the Secretary of State's office do that really influence good government? Well, I think the thing, the, the very best thing we can is to ensure absolutely secure, honest, and integrity in elections, and certainly to have our audits division look at all, all the government that we possibly can in the short time I have here to ensure that government is spending taxpayer money as frugally and efficiently as possible. I'm very impressed with how many uh, hardworking, dedicated state workers we have in the Secretary of State's office, and I know those same workers exist in state agencies uh, around government, but I want to be sure that all of the agencies are operating as efficiently and effectively as possible. We were just talking earlier today about the fact that uh, you came from a small business background, uh, an out of government background, the real estate business. I came from uh, nearly 40 years of practice of law and private practice. And we've been surprised at just how many really dedicated, qualified, hardworking employees there are working here in state government. Can you think of one story uh, that you've heard in the last few days? That well, the one gal that we're, cer we're certainly looking for um, superstars as we go forth and honoring them in the Secretary of State's office, but we had one gal in our call center that just absolutely uh, took over a hundred calls in several days in a row and has just performed brilliantly. We ca I call that going the extra mile. And that's something I've seen all my life. Anybody in agriculture goes the extra mile several times a day. <laughs> and certainly many other things that I've been involved in. So recognizing the people that do that, I think is going to be very important to let them know we appreciate them. We may want to even have some of those folks on this podcast and yes. hear from them and 
yes. why they wanted to be in state government. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that idea? Oh, I think that's a very good idea. Let's talk about budget just for a moment. Um, that was a, a really important part of your legislative activity was being involved in budgets. How did it feel to be on the other side of the budget activity? Well, I came in just as we were, as the Ways and Means Committee was looking at my Secretary of State budget here. Uh, I did cut drastically a bunch of things in the budget just simply because I thought they were things that we could do without. And uh, I've always been one that's pretty frugal when it comes to in-state travel and out-of-state travel. So those were where a lot of the cuts I made. But I just believe with the technology today that the telecommunicating and training via lots of other methods can be done rather than so much travel. The tough part of sitting here and saying I hope my budget is passed is recognizing that when I was on the budget committee a few years ago, somebody else was worrying like I have been today. <laughs> <laughs> talk, talk about budget transparency uh, just a little bit if you would please. Yeah, I think um, one of the things that well you've been working on is trying to look around at other states and see how we can be more transparent in our state budgets and there are states that you can look at at how their transparency is and how they budget and actually find invoices down to the dollar so to speak of what has been spent and I would like to see us be able to get more towards that. I think it's important that government is transparent so everybody knows what we're spending. And you think that's true of every aspect of government. Is Certainly. there any aspect of government you can think of that should feel justified in hiding their expenditures? I can't imagine why. No, I can't imagine why. Madam Secretary, uh, I want to tell you how grateful I am to have been given the opportunity to serve with you. Um, it is really a lot of fun. I have to just mention to folks that uh, this is an office where uh, we may just be sitting here eating lunch together, uh, our doors are typically open and the other executive staff wander in and out. I, I, I have to tell you that I've enjoyed the fact that we've got a grandson that comes in and acts as uh, Mr. Secretary from time to time. What, what do you think kind of uh, about that sort of um, informality or uh, human touch that you've brought to the office and wh why do you think that's important? Well, I think it's important. Number one, I'm glad to have my grandson here because someday when he grows up, the Capitol won't be a place that he's afraid to be in because he can be in here shooting paper basketball <laughs> mods all day. I, I think it's very important to reach out to kids and let them feel comfortable in their state government and their state capital. And I think it's important whoever works here, whether they work with us in this office or any part of the Secretary of State's office or any legislators or their staff feel like that they can come in and say hello and talk to us anytime they want. We're sitting right now, and I wish our, our listeners could see this, in an office that has memorabilia uh, scattered around from Eastern Oregon and, and art that you've collected. Uh, it really does feel like an office that reflects your uh, sort of personality and, and approach to life. I, I hope that I'm not out of line in suggesting that as Secretary of State, you're hoping that many people come and visit you here and uh, sure. that you get to know them. Sure, certainly. I think it's their government, it's their building, and I hope they'll come say hello. All right, is there anything else you think uh, we better talk about before we close this up? I think we're going to have to do more podcasts with the Secretary as time goes on. <laughs> Thank you very much, Rich. This has been the Oregon Matters of State podcast. This is Deputy Secretary of State Rich Vile, here today with Bev Clarno, our Secretary of State. The date is July 30th, 2019, and until we speak again, good day.